She is a member of the USA Track and Field Hall of Fame, was woman Olympic team captain in 2000, named Woman Athlete of the Century, and is one of the greatest runners to come out of New Jersey. Please welcome four-time Olympian, Joetta Clark Diggs. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm excited to be here today. I cannot tell you how enthusiastic I was to find out that I was going to announce Mr. Milton Campbell today. I would like to say growing up in New Jersey, my parents often told me about great athletes and great people in academics. And I heard stories of Muhammad Ali and Wilma Rudolph and Jesse Owens and Jackie Robinson. But Milton Campbell's story resonated with us because he was from Plainfield, New Jersey, exit 10 off of the garden, off of the New Jersey Turnpike. And when we heard those stories about this high school athlete who made two Olympic teams and went on to college and got a silver and gold medal, it made it think that we could do that as well. But when I listened to those stories, my parents would say, he did it with decathlon, and we did not know what that was. We had to look at a dictionary and look at the Britannica Encyclopedia. We didn't have the iPads and things to research him. But we found out that he did 10 events in two days. He did five on one day and five on the next day. And that's exactly what he did in 1952 when he made the Olympic team just before his 18th birthday. He came back to the United States with a silver medal. But that wasn't good enough for him. He trained harder, got stronger and bigger, and he went back and tried out for the 1956 Olympic Games. And guess what? He made that team. And when he left the United States to go to Australia, Melbourne, Australia, he was what they would think an underdog, but not Mr. Milt Campbell. He was a top dog. And when he got into those blocks and he ran the first 100 yards, he ran 10.91 and his competitors took note of that. And what he did, no other athlete has ever done. After competing in only six events, all he had to do was finish the competition and the gold medal would be his. And finish he did. He finished the competition, he set an Olympic gold medal record. He set a world record and he was the first African American to win the gold medal in the decathlon. And when he put that medal around his neck, and he was so excited, I'm sure, because the title of world's greatest athlete belonged to him. He came back to the United States. He didn't have many commercials and things of that nature, but what he did do, he went back to college and he graduated from Indiana University. And after graduating, he found out that track and field was one way for him to get uh, fame, but he played football, and he also said that in sports, he knew that he needed to make a difference, not only in his life, but in the lives of other people. He came back to Plainfield, and he started programs for kids, and he inspired them to go out and go after something, and don't let people steal your vision. So as I stand here today, I spoke to him earlier, and he said to me, you have to shoot for the moon because if you miss, you land amongst the stars. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a star among us today. Mr. Milk Campbell is the high school athlete of the century. He is a native from Plainfield, New Jersey. He's a college graduate, a two-time Olympian, gold medalist, a devoted husband and father. So will you please put your hands together and help me join this star, my Olympic friend, Mr. Milton Campbell. <laughs> Got a few fans out there, huh? <laughs> Governor Burns and Governor Christie and the, the Hall of Fame. I am so deeply honored to be here because it was 
a dream in my life to be somewhere where every kid in New Jersey could take the time and look back and remember there was somebody who came along that believed that he could reach the moon, that he could reach the stars. And I tell all of our kids that today, that they need to reach out and dream and fall in love with that dream and stay with it. Take the journey, make the trip. It's been a heck of a journey. It's been a long one. I got some friends sitting out in the audience now, Wally Choice and Charlie Pratt, and I competed against 60 years ago. And we're brothers today. We can't hang up the phone without saying, I love you, take care of yourself. Okay, I was supposed to have a list and there were supposed to be some things to say. I'm stuttering a little bit and you've never heard a motivational speaker stutter. But, 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 but I, 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 I my, 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 might not get through, 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 through this. <laughs> Fooled you, didn't I? <laughs> I used to do that when I sold encyclopedias and people wouldn't listen to me. I'd start stuttering and <laughs> everybody would listen. <laughs> you know, so I'm well at it. First of all, what I would like to do is I definitely, I definitely want to thank everyone that's here and everyone that voted for me. Uh, it was phenomenal when I heard that I had an opportunity and a chance to uh, to be inducted into the New Jersey Hall of Fame. I, I went all the way around the world with phone calls and told them to call up and vote for me. <laughs> and I told them, I said, if I lose this one, it's your fault. Okay, so, so I know all my friends called up and voted for me. In fact, even down in Georgia, I didn't have very much of a chance to make a lot of friends, but I did make friends. And uh, I, you can tell by this beautiful cane I have here when I got ill and I, I fell one day and I came back and I had to, uh, I had to uh, have a cane to get around with. One of the guys said to me, he says, I'm going out in the woods and he says, I'm gonna get you a stick, I'm gonna make you a cane. And I said, okay. And so he went out there and this is what he made. And when he came back and everybody saw me with the cane, you know, the stick, they said, uh, Milt, what, uh, what do you call the stick? I said, well, this is my redneck cane <laughs> from Georgia. So anyhow, I've been able to move in, down to Georgia, and a uh, big reason for that is we're taking care of my, uh, my partner's mother and father. Her father is uh, going to be 100 years old in October, and her mother is 90. And all my life I loved sitting around and listening to what old folks said because they were the ones that knew what was going on. I have an 18 year older up in the uh, stands right now and he's sitting up here. He's bigger and taller than I am. I know he doesn't think I'm very bright right now but when he gets to be about 40 he'll know what a genius I am. <laughs> But anyhow, but I, I always like sitting around older people because they always had something really good to say and something really smart. I can remember the time that my, uh, my uncle, who was uh, 92 years old, he was sitting with me and my aunt had a group of people over and my aunt said to the group, she says, you know, I just keep praying to Jesus and I pray to Jesus all the time and, and uh, he just won't answer my prayers. And my uncle leaned over to me and he said, she doesn't realize no is an answer. You know? <laughs> so <laughs> I used to love to sit around the old folks and listen to that. Let me say, first of all, I need to start at the beginning. I need to thank mom and dad, Thomas and Edith Campbell for bringing me into such a fabulous and wonderful family. My dad was tough as nails and my mother was sweet as sugar cane. And they gave me an older brother that was a perfect, a perfect role model. Just an absolute perfect role model. Uh, if you followed directly in his footsteps, you wouldn't go wrong. 
And then he gave me a little sister. And my little sister is Sandra, and she's in the stands today. She's with us. But mom and dad and, and my brother are not here. But my little sister one day, I remember I came home. She was about seven years old, eight years old. And I came home, and I had lost the race, and I was a little bit upset about it and so forth. And I was sitting down on the, st on the stoop on the steps, and uh, she came up to me, and she said, What's the matter, Milt? Like that, with her sweet voice. And I said, Oh, don't worry about it. I said, I got beat today, but, um, I said, I got beat today, but, uh, you know, I'm just a little set back about it. She pointed her little finger at me and she said, don't even worry about it. You just go back and beat him. And I looked at this little kid and I thought, <laughs> yeah, okay, well. Then I went on a winning streak because I couldn't, uh, I couldn't let her down. I couldn't let her down, you know. And she became one of my greatest cheerleaders and she's in the audience also today. Let me thank my high school coaches. What a wonderful group of men they were. Harold Begeer, I think, was a man that was looking through life for a kid like me. He was looking for someone that would work hard, someone that would listen to what he said, and someone that would do everything that he said. Harold Begeer began to orchestrate my life. By the time I was a junior in high school, he had introduced me to the decathlon and said that we were going to make the Olympic team. And, you know, lots of times coaches said, we're going to do this here. You know, I'm going to do the work, you know. But he said, we're going to make the Olympic team. And I said, okay, coach. And we did. And we came back, and we were the second best athlete in the world. And I told him, because when I came back, he was on his dying bed. And I told him, I said, coach, you can't die. I said, I'm going back, and I'm going to win this thing. Earl Begeer said to me, he said, Milt, he said, a coach looks for a kid like you all his life. And he said, and I've had you. He said, I can die now. He said, I've had the best athlete in the world. And I told him and I made a promise to him that I would go back and I won to win that. And I went back and I won it. Even when they told me that Rayford Johnson was the world record holder and the Russian was breaking the world record holder. And I told a guy from Cleveland, I said, uh, yeah, but I wasn't there. You know, I said, there'll be a difference when, when I show up. And Rayford Johnson comes into my room at the Olympic Games the day before the decathlon. And he said, Milt, how do you think this is all going to turn out? And I said to Rayford, I said, well, it's too bad you showed up at this time because this one's mine and I'm going to do everything I had to do to get it. And he said, I'm going to win this one. He said, you think so? I said, no, I know so. And when I looked at the look on his face, I realized I discouraged him so much. I said, damn, he might take fourth or fifth. I don't want him, I don't want him that discouraged, you know. Just go ahead and take second and you'll be fine, you know. <laughs> so anyhow, I want to thank those coaches. I want to thank uh, Harold Begeer. I want to thank Mr. Liss, Vic Liss. Vic Liss was a swimming coach. And I don't know whether you remember or not, but back in the 50s, they told us that black kids couldn't swim. I don't mean when they were keeping us out of the pools and stuff. They just said that it wasn't in our genes. It, they said it wasn't in our genes. And I asked the boy uh, on the swimming team when he asked me, did I want to swim? And I said, yeah, I was thinking about doing that. And he looked at me and he said, I don't think you can do it because all the waters in Africa where your heritage comes from has crocodiles and snakes in it and you wouldn't learn how to swim. He said, it's not in your genes. And I looked at him and, and he, as he walked away and I thought, what the hell has that got to do with me? I was born in Plainfield, New Jersey. <laughs> so, so Mr. Liss comes over and Mr. Liss comes over, he sees these big hands and these big feet and he thinks, man, if I could get this kid to propel through the water, he said, I'd make him a champion. Well, the coach asked me, he said, well, would you like to swim? And I said, yes. He said, what event would you like to do? I said, what does he do? <laughs> you know, and he looked at me and he said, well, he's our premier sprinter and uh, he's our state champion and all that. And he says, uh, he does that. I said, well, I won't do what he wants. He does. So at the end of the first year, he would touch and I would touch. And then he graduated and went on somewhere in his life. And at the end of the second year, 
I was an all-American swimmer. And uh, and uh, a month ago, a month ago today, is that right, honey? A month ago today, I was inducted into the International Swimmers Hall of Fame. I like to tell that story for the simple reason is, is I want kids to hear it. And what I want you to really hear is don't let anybody tell you what you can't do. Because really when people are telling you what you can't do, they're looking at the picture in their mind of what they can do. And they happen to translate that to you. You can make, if you make up your mind, if you fall in love with the dream, you can do anything you want to. You can do, be, or have anything in your life that you want. You see, the one thing that you may not know, that we know today, is everything in life is a learning experience. That's all it is. It's a learning experience. And as long as you've got a mind, you can learn. And as long as there's a goal out there, you can accomplish it. Okay, so let me go on and thank all my friends that voted for me. I said this at the, uh, at the um, Olympic Hall of Fame when they, after many years, I wasn't elected into the New Jersey, I mean, into the Olympic Hall of Fame. A lot of time went by, and Rayford Johnson was in it, Bob Mathias was in it, Bill Toomey was in it, Bruce Jenner was in it. And all these guys got inducted into the Hall of Fame before me. And I said this at the Hall of Fame, and I meant it from the bottom of my heart. I said thank you to every single person who voted for me. And those of you that didn't vote for me, you must have been misinformed. <laughs> That's all you put there. Anyhow, I have an I have a audience full of people here today that uh, surprised me and. Uh, they're throwing a party for me tomorrow, so me and my cane and my lovely uh, partner will be there and my family will be there. I've got, uh, I don't know whether you know it about, uh, but I'm a real community man. I uh, had four children of my own, natural birth. I brought in five other children to live with me. My daughter used to bring them in left and right, and she said, well, daddy, uh, her mom and dad don't like her. I said, okay, we put a plate at the table. And then she'd come again with another one. I said, well, look, you got, you got one in bed with you. You got one laying on your floor. I said, uh, I'm not giving up the den and I'm not giving up my bedroom. Now, where are we going to put this child? Well, my daughter would say, well, we can, she'll sleep on the couch, you know, like this here. Next thing I know, uh, two weeks would go by and she'd come smiling again. I said, no, Julie. I said, no, this ain't going to happen no more. I can't bring no more chickens. But we brought another one in. We took care. Needless to say, she's a social worker today. Okay? <laughs> but she got her practice on her dad <laughs> when she was young. Uh, I have a thousand and one people that I would like to say thank you to. I am not going to say thank you to any of my M going to uh, mention Wally Choice's name because Wally and I for 60 years have been with each other, battling each other, and as my brother passed away, Wally became my brother. You trying to tell me I'm through? Okay, I'll quit. I don't get to do this but once in a lifetime, so <laughs> please give me a break. You know, so uh, anyhow. <laughs> Anyhow, I want to tell you that uh, I'm, I'm extremely proud. I'm extremely happy. I've been asked uh, many times if I would do this all over again, and you bet your life for New Jersey, for America, for you, for mom, for apple pie, and for me, I'd do it all over again. Okay? Thank you very much.